We used to just call it rangeland, where cattle ranged and wildlife ranged. Shrub step is just a little more accurate description. 99% of the species are grasses and, and wildflowers, and yet those big shrubs are what you notice first. That's why we call it shrub step. When you put yourself down at the level of that landscape, you are gonna see a forest. It's just gonna be a different type of forest, from the big tall shrubs to the real small lichens. It's all integrated into this amazing landscape. It's just so hard to see when we're standing, it's, you know, a few feet above it, driving by at 60 miles an hour. It's definitely not a desert. It has every component that you'd find in the highest mountains and the highest national parks in the world as far as species of wildlife, species of plants, rare and endangered plants and animals, views, how they're all intertwined together is really special out here. And so I think people are just now waking up to how special it really is. There's so much biodiversity. Big game, small game, coyotes, historically wolves. Burrowing owls. Raptors flying around doing their daily chores of trying to find something to eat. Yellow-headed blackbirds. Bald eagles, golden eagles. We have peregrine falcons. Sage grouse. The sharp-tailed grouse, pygmy rabbit. Washington ground squirrel, white-tailed jackrabbit, black-tailed jackrabbit, pronghorn. Bobcats, a fairly healthy cougar population. You also find elk. There's black bear. It's also not uncommon to see a moose meandering across the shrub step. So many reptiles and amphibians out there that are just so interesting and you won't find them anywhere else. It's not quite like you're you know, in the big forest where it's more obvious what the, what the beauty is. It just takes some time to appreciate. We have 800 foot basalt cliffs, and at any given time of the day, those cliffs are a different color, depending on how the sunlight's striking them. Wildflowers add color to it from the pinks and yellows and reds and blues. It's an amazing amount of color. There is a long cultural history, not just white history, but Native American history. This land holds our history. Our survival has meant understanding this land and the resources and what they can offer. Since time immemorial, we have been taught that this land is a part of us. There's value out here for all kinds of uses, for bird watching, for, for wildlife itself, just for their own livelihoods, for people that use that wildlife, whether it's for hunting or photography or just enjoyment, just to see it. We've been out just exploring wildflowers this spring and we've probably identified 60 species of wildflowers just close to our house. If people wanted to experience, you know, the shrub step actually at night is really amazing. Because it's so hot during the day in the summertime, it actually comes alive at night. The stars are amazing. There's opportunities for biking, for horseback riding, but I just particularly like to walk <laughs> and see it from foot. Looking at the land for our food, that's gonna feed me, it's gonna feed my children. 
you have a connection with the people that have come before you that have gathered in that area. You have a connection with the people that are gathering alongside you, continuing something that has been done on this land since time immemorial. I feel a lot of people's lies when I'm out in the Shrub Step community, including my own, and including, I think, maybe a, a thought to the future that we're trying to say, hey, you got to preserve this. You got to have this. It just can't go away. It just can't go away. It's too valuable. The fire intensity has changed in these landscapes, and so we're getting these mega fires. Historically, would have been smaller fires burning less hot, covering less acres, but more often. And now what we have is big fires happening all at once, very hot, and doing a lot of damage. That damage then can not always be repaired. When a fire starts in Trub Step, if it's not put out right away, they often become 40, 50, 60,000 acre fires overnight. The shrub step that you find in Washington tends to be very fragmented. What we have tried to do is to focus on programs like converting cropland into conservation reserve program, which has resulted in the conversion of former wheat fields to something that looks and acts like shrub step, and it's supporting a lot of sage grouse. We understood that with our relationship with the resources, sometimes they needed rest, sometimes they needed management. The tribe right now utilizes what's called adaptive management with our partners. I definitely think that partnerships help. So we have partnerships with WDFW to help the different resources. That's something that the Department of Wildlife is trying to do. It's something that they're partnering with us, Conservation Northwest, because it's, it's all our goals together. Way before white settlement, there was history, and we've got a lot to learn there and think about, and maybe incorporate into what we're doing today. We've returned species to this land because we've elevated our elders' historical knowledge about this land. And to now see those restoration examples and these things be a part and incorporate our elders' knowledge is huge. What that's gonna result in is it's gonna be more efficient. You're gonna find things that will work because you understand the landscape and what resources worked with each other. Even though we have fragmented shrub step, we don't want to treat those areas as throwaway. We do need to protect and improve the quality of the really big patches and also do whatever we can to connect these smaller patches to the bigger patches. The more we can do to improve the quality of habitat on the big patches, the better we'll be doing for all the shrub step wildlife. It's important that we fight for it and to keep it intact. Literally anybody can be a steward of the shrub step. They often have volunteer days to clean up riparian areas, to take down old barbed wire fences that are hard on the wildlife. So I'm John Galley, a wildlife biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm leading the recovery effort for the federally endangered Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbit. Behind me is one of the uh, release areas where we are trying to reestablish a wild population. They're doing what we were hoping. They're acclimating well and they're starting to get established in this area. There's a sage grouse initiative focused on working with private landowners to help sage grouse, but also improve the quality of the habitat. The greater sage grouse in Washington are actually really struggling now. We have three populations of sage grouse in the state of Washington. The largest population with about 90% of the remaining birds is in Douglas County. They're landscape species. They need big landscapes to survive. And they're a shrub step dependent bird, which is an important part of this equation because they live on sagebrush. They eat sagebrush. They have a digestive system that makes them one of the few species that can actually eat the leaves of a plant that other species find poisonous. 
they're basically a very important component of that ecosystem. So when you see that ecosystem, to see sage grouse is to know that that area is functioning like it should. The land and our resources continually tell a story, and it's up to us to go out and figure out how to have a relationship with this land. It's part of our culture, it's part of what makes the West the West. You might just be amazed at how silent it is, and it's a big silence, and I think that's pretty special too. I talked with a rancher yesterday that said, when those bird watchers come out, I love to go talk to them. I love to go explain to them, you know, why those birds are there and what I know about it. That's what it's all about. We don't have this blue-red thing going on. We have an appreciation of the same things. Communities, economies, wildlife, beauty, ecosystem, and it all comes together right here in Shrub Step. Scientists are beginning to challenge our understanding of avian cognition. New experiments explore how birds think, revealing a mind which is more familiar to humans than appearances might suggest. Initially, cognition really was thought to be the province of the primates, the chimpanzees and some of the monkeys. And it wasn't until more recently, with pioneering work done on, on parrots and some of the work we've done on corvids, that people realised that these very distantly related animals had cognitive abilities on a par with the great apes. Nikki is working with birds from the corvid family, like this raven, drawing inspiration for experiments from a rather unlikely source, stage magic. Look how Bran pays attention. The berry is hidden. Let's see if he'll follow it. Moving the object provides a window into Bran's mind, showing that he can visualise its past and present location. Magic reveals some fascinating things about cognition, and particularly constraints on cognition, in both humans and animals, because magic effects capitalise on the blind spots in our seeing and the roadblocks in our thinking. Let's challenge a blind spot. How will Bran react when the berry seemingly vanishes? Will he be tricked? Ah! Surprise? A familiar reaction for humans, but a bird? It takes brains to expect a future, which fails to manifest. We don't entirely understand why Bran has evolved to be like this, but it may boil down to food. What these corvids do is they hide food, we call it caching, and they do this for a living. 
but they go to great lengths as well to deceive their spectators, their onlookers, of the location of the cache. And in doing that, they use a lot of tactics that are akin to the tools magicians use. These wild magicians use trickery to deceive thieving competition. Apparently anticipating, imagining, what another thinks is not uniquely human. This is truly the realm of life and death. Adapt and survive, or descend into the barrow of extinction. Misdirection obscures where the food is hidden. Driving their beak into the ground, they put on a show by pretending to cash many times. Ever conscious of others, secrecy means survival in a dangerous world. Dreaming objects into existence was also thought to be a hallmark of ape cognition. We now know that advanced tool use is commonplace among New Caledonian crows. These are lab crows, but on their island kingdom, dynasties of these birds have learnt to craft different tools for different situations. Species which don't appear to use tools in the wild have the latent potential for innovation. In 2009, scientists Nathan Emery and Chris Bird presented this rook with a wire and a bucket of food. Creating a hook with just a beak is no mean feat. This experiment opened a new avenue of inquiry. What would happen if an imaginative ape took on this task? Sarah Beck applied this experiment to the development of cognition in human children. We know that children are really good at using tools. They use spoons and straws and even technology like remote controls. And we also know that they're very creative. They engage in pretend play. But what we didn't know is whether they could use this creativity to create a new tool and solve this puzzle. So you can just stand there. Now, are you going to have a go at my game? So, can you see, there's a tube. Can you use something that's on the table in front of you? Um, do you? Yeah, what do you think you could use? Have a go and see if you can get the egg. These tiny tool users were expected to have no issue creating a hook. The important elements are apparent, but they just can't seem to innovate like the rooks in the lab. And can you have a go at my game? So you can see this tube with an egg in it. And do you think you could get the egg out of the tube? Can you use something on the table? See that there's an egg in the bottom of that tube? Yes. Well, inside that egg, we'll try and get that egg. As the human mind matures, we become better at problem solving. Innovating a new solution is different from using a tool, as it requires a greater degree of mental flexibility. And one of the things that's been really interesting is with the children being able to include the phase of the experiment where we show them what they might do and how well children um, perform then when they've seen what the answer to the problem is. So almost all the children then immediately solve the task. And that fits with this idea that what humans are really good at is learning from other people. So we're, we're used to learning language, um, how to use tools, um, our culture from each other. And that's what we need to live in our really complex worlds. 
Although wildly different, an analogous current seems to run through our ape and bird minds. My husband, Nathan Emery, coined the term feathered apes in an article that he and I wrote in Science. They're very different species and they shared a common ancestor over 300 million years ago, but we're arguing that they had the same kinds of physical and social challenges to overcome. Whether it is engaging with human pastimes such as magic or besting young minds at problem solving, each piece of the puzzle improves our understanding of avian minds and even our own. If an animal's environment is its canvas, its mind is the paint. And evidently these feathered artists could be closer to humans than we might expect. This is probably the most important year ever for us to be listening to these whales. We have the ability to collect something that never would have happened before. We've known for a very long time that the ocean is noisy. And we've known that the whales suffer because of the noise. But we've never been able to prove it. And now, I believe we will. When you put a hydrophone in the water and you listen to whales, it actually completes the picture of what's really happening. In order to understand whales, you have to listen. Wokalab is a land-based whale research station on Hanson Island. Its method is uh, non-intrusive as a matter of philosophy because although we're interested in whales, we don't want to interfere with their lives. So this summer is particularly significant for Orcolab and I guess the rest of the world um, due to the presence of coronavirus. We've received the news that um, there will be no cruise ships um, coming through this area for the whole of the summer. So this is actually what a cruise ship sounds like when it comes through our hydrophone network. unpleasant noise and you can hear in there there's the constant static and then there's the ch -ch 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 of the propeller. I always think when I'm listening to the headphones when it gets really bad like I can just simply take them off and I can have a little bit of a rest but they don't have the option to do that. You know if you think about how long whales have been communicating with each other in the ocean and if you go back thousands of years they evolved in this quiet ocean and it's only in the last few hundred years where boat noise has increased 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 globally and that's not a, that doesn't give them enough time to adapt their behavior with bigs orca when they're foraging when they're hunting they're listening for the sounds of their prey so when a vessel comes through and makes this noise it actually impairs their ability to find food, which is extremely important. We are really excited about getting these hydrophones in the water right now. That's why this project is so important. There's no other time where suddenly you're going to have such a decrease in the amount of boats going through here. I can't wait to see how these whales react to this. So it all starts on land. So you're going to have to install your batteries and your solar panels because you need power. 
From there, you're going to have to go through an intertidal zone. And that cable is then going to be given to a group of divers, because at the end of that cable is this hydrophone that is pretty sensitive material. And then these divers are going to take that hydrophone down. You're really connecting the land to the sea, which is what it's all about, so that us on the land can listen to whales. Once we have all these systems in place, we'll be able to compare from one site to another all the way up and down the coast. We'll have an ability to track whales through the area, take a look at habitat usage, whether you need to move shipping lanes in areas to help uh, mitigate sound impact on the whales. The downside is that we'll be collecting a massive amount of information. We'll be collecting about 183 terabytes a year for the whole coast. Um, and there's just not enough acousticians and bioacousticians on the planet to analyze all that data. So uh, we're, we're trying to put in automated uh, detection, uh, tracking and, and location software. I think that with, the, with this hydrophone network, with uh, an array of hydrophones where you can pinpoint the sources of sound, you may ultimately be able to answer that question, who's talking? And if you can get to who's talking, you might, I'm not promising, uh, be able to say, what are they saying? So do I get to listen to yeah. it now? Wow. Oh. oh, that is, <laughs> that is amazing. That is a huge, huge difference. Yeah, it's no, so clear, no so crisp. Coming through. That is really beautiful. These these are some of the best wow. hydrophone deployments that I've ever done in terms of being quiet. That ability for us to compare last year's data, this year's data, and then going forward into 2021 to see if there's an actual difference is a massive opportunity to really document how these whales will react to a quiet ocean in an area where it has it, it has historically been very noisy. If we can prove that whales prefer quiet oceans and the absence of noise, government regulators should pay attention and change the way in which they manage the oceans and particularly shipping on the oceans. And if fingers crossed, if governments pay attention, things might get better for the whales. The General Power Monitoring Data Set provides historical trend data for juvenile Chinook salmon and steelhead trout in Idaho. Permanent sites and good habitat were subjectively chosen. Snorkeling is used to collect information about fish abundance in these sites. The transects are surveyed during the summer according to annual, biannual, triennial, and opportunistic schedules. This is a five-person crew. Narrow streams require only one snorkeler, while larger sites require the entire crew to thoroughly survey them. Once a crew reaches a snorkel site, it typically entails belly crawling 50 to 200 yards upstream, against strong currents, over and around rocks, and in bone-chilling water. When the crews are done for the season, they are probably in the best physical shape of their lives. Besides Chinook salmon and steelhead trout, 
crews will observe coho salmon, native cutthroat and bull trout, as well as other fish and amphibians. Fortunately, the opportunity to work in such incredible locations easily overshadows any discomfort associated with getting the data. Sheep Creek and Granite Creek are tributaries of the Snake River. They are located in the Hell's Canyon Reach and originate high in the Seven Devils Mountain Range. Each creek contains two transects that are surveyed annually. The upper transects on both creeks have a gentler gradient compared to those downstream. The lower transects are mostly pocket water defined by large boulders. Granite, the uppermost creek, is 72 miles from the Hellerbar boat ramp. The crews access the sites by jet boat. The trip takes two full days and includes a night at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's remote Sand Creek Cabin. Accessing snorkel sites can be quite challenging. Crews go by foot, horse, plane, jet boat, and raft to reach them. Remote sites typically involve a day or two of hiking and an overnight stay along the stream. Crews are generally in the field for eight days at a time. This reach of the Snake River is located in the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. It contains designated wild and scenic river sections. At over one and a half miles from the summit of He Devil Mountain to the mouth of Granite Creek, it is the deepest river canyon in North America. There are no roads across Hell's Canyon's 10 mile wide expanse, and only three roads lead to the Snake River between Hell's Canyon Dam and the Oregon Washington boundary. On the way upriver, the crew stopped to snorkel the Sheep Creek transects. This was a long day. The crew woke up in Idaho, got onto a boat in Washington, worked in Idaho, and will eat dinner and sleep in Oregon. This was a great day. On the second day, the crew continued upriver to Granite Creek. There are many class four rapids in Hell's Canyon. Only the most skilled jet boat pilots can safely navigate this reach. Boaters must have permits to float through it. Besides class four whitewater rapids, the crews must contend with the blockades of poison ivy at Granite Creek. The plants can be chest high and completely cover hundreds of yards of trail to the survey sites. In 2019, three crew members, including two project veterans, had bad reactions to the plant and required medical attention after returning home. The plant's toxins had penetrated their pants. Consequently, the crew will wear protective Tyvek suits. Crews used one Tyvek suit to get to the survey site and a new one to return in. The air temperature was 105 degrees. This made the water especially inviting. Lack of significant rainfall, coupled with record-breaking temperatures, 
made wildfires a serious concern this season. Fires forced crews to drastically modify their survey site schedule. The fires also filled the air with smoke that limited the degree to which crews could exert themselves while walking to and from sites. It is not uncommon for crews to carry 60 pounds or more of gear and hike several miles each day. Chinook salmon and steelhead were observed in both creeks. From here, the crew will travel to Locksaw River in East Central Idaho to survey more sites. Since June, the crew surveyed dozens of sites all across central Idaho, from the borders of Montana to Washington and Oregon. The data they collected will help resource managers make informed decisions to benefit Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. So monarch butterfly is a big, beautiful orange and black butterfly that can be seen in a lot of places throughout North America. And when I get to go out and watch butterflies, it's just so wonderful to see how beautiful life is. Butterflies are really interesting and they're in trouble. Most species of insects, including monarch butterflies, are rapidly declining and vanishing. And so how do we save these beautiful species that we all know is part of the biodiversity that makes the earth function? There are so many things that are fascinating about monarch butterflies. One is that they're long distance migrants. They go from North America, north of the US border, which is where we are now into Canada, and they come south and they go all the way to a mountainous region in central Mexico. All along the way, they need food, they need rest areas. But without them, they face habitat loss and death. So the Niagara River Corridor is located in the Great Lakes at the eastern end of Lake Erie, and it is just where all the water flows and where a lot of life flows and relies on. What's really changed a lot in the last 100, 200 years, though, is that humans have had an impact uh, as they've urbanized, as they've industrialized, as they've hardened the shorelines. Well, this whole area is called Times Beach Nature Preserve. And we're located in downtown Buffalo, right on the edge of Lake Erie and the Niagara River. It's a beautiful little green jewel amongst an urban wilderness. Well, for a long time, uh, this site was used as a contained disposal facility for the Corps of Engineers when they were dredging the Buffalo River and the Buffalo Harbor, and it filled up with toxic sediments. When they discovered it was toxic, they closed it. And so in the 70s, a bunch of people, including myself, came along and said, well, 
there's a lot of birds that are visiting here. There's a lot of insects that are here. There's a lot of butterflies that are here. Why don't we try to reclaim it and make it a nature area? The monarchs, which have been coming here more frequently because of the rest stop that we've provided, have sometimes come here in numbers of thousands. So the Pollinator Conservation Association has a mission to conserve pollinators. We create resilient shorelines, we create living shorelines, we create habitat. It helps protect human life as well as the life of the flora and fauna that we depend on. We work collaboratively with a lot of institutions, whether they're government agencies, not-for-profit organizations, or educations of higher learning. The University of Buffalo works to help inform us with research about things like tagging butterflies, uh, looking at the size of the monarch caterpillars, counting the number of eggs, seeing where they're laying eggs, and basically measuring their general condition. Oh wait, yeah, yeah, look it. That's an egg. Ooh. Oh yeah, there is some more. Really? Three, four, three eggs right there. Research is so important. Without research, we really don't know what to do or what we've done. People can do a lot of things to help. It uh, starts with being aware, uh, going outdoors, experiencing nature, doing what they can to protect nature. Use more native plants. Native plants are so fundamental to the success of the life of so many pollinators. Since the beginning of time, it can be argued that the culture of humanity has been to defeat nature. We're at a point now where we've just about done it. In order for us to survive as humans, we've got to learn to live with nature, work with nature, and help nature to support us. We have to find ways to work together to make sure that we have a future. Sizzling temperatures and dry conditions have fueled the 416 fire. The county manager has declared a state of local disaster. More than 2,100 homes are evacuated and more than 20,000 acres have burned just north of Durango. It's usually not the immediate fire that affects the fish population. It's the monsoonal rainstorm that happens afterwards. That rainstorm just sends tons of mud and ash and lots of nasty chemicals that come out of the soils and trees and it's toxic to fish. So we knew it was going to be a devastating event. How did you explain to your wife that you were driving into a wildfire to rescue a fish? <laughs> She's used to it. I do have one fish joke. What did the uh, smallmouth bass say to the largemouth bass when he ran into the dam? Hey, you dumb bass. Oh boy. My name is Jim White. I'm an aquatic biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. A lot of people have no idea, but it's an awesome job. I think the cool thing about fish is most people don't really get to know them. Fish do have personalities. They very much have a hen pecking order, particularly trout. 
A friend of mine one time said you, you couldn't help but be anything but a fish biologist and he was correct when he uh, said that. Cutthroat trout are absolute jewel of a trout. Anybody that's ever seen one, they're, they're fantastic, but they're fairly delicate. They typically occupy sort of these more open reaches. That's probably why their coloration is the way it is. It's kind of that goldeny, bronzy color that matches really well if you're in a sunlit stream. Cutthroat trout were widespread before Western settlement. During that time, there was a destruction of not only the uh, natural environment, but also the introduction of non-native uh, trout. Because cutthroat trout did not evolve with any other species of trout in the systems, they didn't evolve sort of defense mechanisms against increased competition and predation by these other uh, trout species, and so they quickly started to disappear. Just in the state of Colorado, we've learned a lot. In the last 12 years, have been very informative about the distribution of cutthroat trout. Way down in the southwest part of Colorado, where we are now, there's a uh, variation that we we're calling the San Juan cutthroat trout that's unique genetically. And that San Juan cutthroat trout was, as recently as just a few years ago, thought to be extinct. But uh, in 2018, using genetics from cutthroat trout in the area, we were able to trace back populations that we knew about and confirm that San Juan cutthroat trout were indeed still around. It was awesome to realize that those native fish were still present, but it was also somewhat terrifying recognizing that most of these populations that I was aware of were extremely small and vulnerable to things like wildfire. Why is it necessary to conserve species? <laughs> That's a great question. People might argue that, well, it's hair splitting. You know, we already had the Colorado cutthroat trout, and then we did genetic testing, and we realized that, wow, there's actually some subspecies of this, some different strains. And the question becomes, is it important to preserve that? It's a never-ending chore to try and figure out how to manage land. Every piece of property you manage is unique. Banded Peak Ranch sits in the Navajo Basin, the upper Navajo Basin, and is essentially an, an entire watershed. It's 52,000 acres, and when you look at those 52,000 acres in, in a topography like this, I mean, that's a lot of land. It takes you a couple hours to drive around from one end to the other for sure. We typically get about 250 inches of snow a year. It gives us a pretty short window of time that we can do work. Hauling livestock, hauling equipment, hauling logs around, that sort of thing. So uh, we got to run diesels just because I got the power to do it. Do you kind of develop like an emotional connection to your truck? I don't, absolutely not, no. I barely have an emotional connection to my family. <laughs> my name is Tim Harmon. I'm the ranch manager at the Banded Peak Ranch. There's a lot of water that comes off of this particular ranch, which is a drinking water source for cities like Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Unfortunately, if we were to get a catastrophic wildfire in here, it does a lot of damage to the soil, causes a lot of post-fire erosion. The primary reason we're working in the forest is to thin those forests so that when a, a wildfire does come through, it doesn't burn so hot. You end up with these big, what we call slash piles. 
one of the best ways to get rid of those and put those nutrients back in the soil is actually to light them on fire. I think it's absolutely important to invest in cutthroat. Anytime you have an opportunity to take a unique organism and preserve it and protect it, it's worth doing, worth the resources. If you're able to do that on an entire watershed, then you really you start to have a real impact. Population growth is a really major factor on wildlife throughout the Rocky Mountains. What you're starting to see is just loss of viable habitat and obviously kind of a, a warming trend is really showing a, a heavy impact I think in this region. When you start talking forest management or river restoration, those are, those are very expensive endeavors. It's typically at a pretty steep cost to ownership to manage their property. So this is where the 416 fire happened. We are at the southern end of the fire, uh, not far from where it started. And this was two years ago that it burned, but you can still see the large standing uh, dead timber from the severity of the burn. As the fire started really gaining momentum, we realized that two of our populations of San Juan cutthroat trout were in this drainage. We had worked out a deal with the Forest Service to mount this rescue. We had just a few hours to remove the fish from the stream. We had, I think, six miles of four-wheeler access, two and a half miles of, of hike, and we could see the fire growing in the, in the sort of distance and had to drive through the, the fire zone to get out of there. Once we got the fish back to the trailhead, um, we realized that we had a truck full of San Juan cutthroat trout, but that was just the start of a new journey. Jim, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? Good, welcome back. Good to see you. On this ranch, we happen to have two of the six existing streams that have that San Juan strain of the Colorado Cut. Today, we took some fish that they raised in the hatchery and reintroduced them into a new stream. We needed partners with other streams that had San Juan cutthroat trout in them to, to step up and help us create more genetically diverse populations. Bandit Peak Ranch was ideal for setting up a pond that could strengthen the San Juan cutthroat trout populations. It's important to locate habitats that, that don't have non-native fish in them. They're pretty harmful to Colorado River cutthroat trout because they outcompete them, they prey on them, and they also hybridize. On public land, it's relatively rare to find a piece of water that hasn't already had non-native fish widely distributed in the uh, watershed above that lake. Having a really good working relationship with private land owners is critical. Bandit Peak Ranch has some of the most remote uh, headwater streams in the state of Colorado. The ranch has been incredibly conservation-minded and on board with uh, everything we've ever proposed, so it's been a wonderful partnership. Aldo Leopold said, you know, preserve every cog in the wheel because you may not understand how important that one cog is. That philosophy guides our management for cutthroat trout. 
personally, I think that there's value in, in all of these species that we have. And I think there's probably a, a lot going on within ecosystems that we don't understand. As we lose that diversity, there's gonna be impacts to those ecosystems. Private land holdings are critical for conservation of not just fish, but wildlife as well. They're undisturbed by the general public. They provide this sort of refuge from anglers. One of the beauties of private land is that you have an opportunity to experiment a little bit. As long as you're partnering with the right authorities, then you can have some real action-oriented projects and hopefully get results quickly. In this particular area, there's a really amazing effort at collaborative land management between the states, between the Forest Service, private landowners. There's a place at the table for everyone. I think there's real power in that. Releasing these fish into the wild is, is really a, an awesome feeling. They've had a lot thrown at them, but they're persisting. There are a lot of folks out there who really want to see native species flourish. That gives me hope about the future of cutthroat trout. Faster than you, rabbit. Eee! How can we go across? Those things got Skunky killed when he tried to cross. Eee! Wolf, bear, we have to do something about getting the others across. Or the protector animals. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> I am making this. It's an atolatl. Those Eeth Gubby use this to throw their spears far when they hunt. Don't worry, Mr. Bunny. The wolf will catch you. I think you were doing that the hard way. Let me show you something. Yeah. Look. There's a path to cross the highway. Yeah. <laughs> Wildlife crossings like bridges and tunnels reduce collisions and make roads safer for everyone. Banff has been a world leader in animal crossings that reduce animals' deaths and car crashes. But the animals don't stop at the park boundaries. It's time to extend the benefits of wildlife crossing systems beyond the national parks.
Every time I see a rock crane, I'm in a place I love. High up in the mountains, in the long days of summer. It's my first time filming here instead of hiking and I decide to record only what is real and unforced. So no walking past the camera as if I didn't know it was there. No slow motion, no aerial shots. Just what you'd see for yourself if you came here and gave your attention. Granted, I do take care to find a good composition. Rock wren aren't so well known. When New Zealanders picture an alpine bird, it's usually one of these guys. Kea. Kea actually spend a lot of time below the bush line. Year round, this is the land of the rock wren. They scour the terrain for bugs and berries, hopping more often than flying. Shady nooks and crannies provide the richest hunting grounds. We tend to think of the natural world as a simpler place. And it can be relaxing. But nature's patterns are complex, much more so than our own flat, four-cornered designs. This place has depth. Hiking in the hills has always been therapeutic for me, but I start to feel uneasy as I'm filming. Instead of simply appreciating this rock wren, I'm anxious to capture him. Has my camera twisted our encounter by making him my subject? I have time to reflect on this in the heat of the day, when the rock wren take cover. Places like this are known to promote quiet contemplation. Scores of studies show the psychological benefits of wilderness experiences. My mind keeps returning to ideas of connection and how we relate to the natural world. In this vast landscape, it's easier to open up, to be receptive to feelings as well as thoughts. The mountain's great solid presence anchors me. I know it rose from the sea. I know ice and wind erode it. But I feel its strength and stillness deep in my bones.
when I see plants flourishing in a sheltered corner, I don't just think, those are different types of buttercup. I also feel my heart lifted. Life's tenacity encourages me. Perhaps being here revives ancient sensibilities, an affinity that some call biophilia. It feels right to connect with the natural world, to relate to it. Could this be the same indignation I'd feel if someone trespassed on my perch? In this environment of exposure and extremes, a turn in the weather brings the thrill of uncertainty. It feeds my senses, long dulled by too much time indoors. I'm tempted to retreat, but there's always a sheltered spot to be found. It's hard to imagine these tiny birds surviving the extremes of winter. But it's introduced pests that have put rock wren on the endangered list. A summer storm is no problem for local wildlife, though it's a little cold for me. Everywhere I look, there are signs of interrelatedness. I don't see this place as a collection of plants and animals. It is an event, a choir of voices in song. And no voice can harmonize in isolation. We belong to the natural world, though it's easy to forget our place within it. We walk on smooth, clean pavements and find our food in packets on shelves. I wonder how many of us just sit in nature and watch. On this trip, my attention is divided. Find the bird. Get the shot. Even so, I've never spent this long watching rock wren. It gives me a better feel for their behaviour. They keep an eye on me, but otherwise get on with their business and alarm.
Ask anyone who's been accepted by a wild creature, and they'll tell you. It's a special feeling. I know I'm only a visitor here, and that nature can be brutal as well as beautiful. But this is not just a holiday, not merely time away from the human-made world. I come here to see more, to feel more, and in a way to become less. To let go of my limited sense of self. It's not a loss. It's a kind of reunion. A fundamental shift in my perception. Spending quiet time, receptive to nature's voices, reminds me of the influence of my own. Like the rock wren, I want to stay in tune with the natural world, and as a human with choice and responsibility, I want to make sure my actions never upset the rhythm of our planet's mysterious song. Restoration is a big, crazy disturbance event. We go in almost like human beavers, really. So the chainsaw goes roaring in. And then we've got teams of draggers dragging wood out of the pond. 
you then start digging in earnest and scraping away at this mud and ideally exposing these old seed bank layers, which is how we get all the life back in the pond. Carl Sayer is on a mission to revive the ponds of Norfolk. These ponds have a long history. For centuries, they were managed because the materials in the ponds were useful. The wood was useful, the mud was useful that was put on the fields. And then somewhere around about the 1950s, 60s, but there was this real pressure to produce more food, so they started to fill in the ponds. And you have these things called ghost ponds, these dark depressions in the fields where you can see there were ponds in the past that are still out there. They can be resurrected as well. Bringing these ponds back to life, you know, I think it, it brings, um, I think it brings part of the soul back to life. It makes you realise people who are in the 50s, 60s, now 70s, what we've lost since our childhood. I was brought up in an era where you went out in the morning and then you came back at night and the whole day was in the countryside. Where I lived in North Norfolk, I was surrounded by ponds and so I went to those ponds to catch newts, to fall in, to dry out afterwards. It's not only a way of life that has vanished. We're at a biodiversity crisis, especially in fresh waters. And ponds are incredible reservoirs of freshwater species. The crucial thing is their setting. They're in the middle of farmland, where wildlife is under the biggest threat. Putting the ponds back starts to rejuvenate bird and pollinator populations and demonstrate that farming can coexist with nature. Carl's work is also inspiring a new generation of pond conservationists. Among them is Jack Greenhalge. The reason I love ponds is mainly because of Carl. I quickly discovered that he just made me laugh all the time. And also through his lectures, he gave a real passion for, for freshwater conservation and for, for ponds in particular. My research is about using non-invasive techniques, techniques that don't disturb the environment or necessarily kill species to survey freshwater ecosystems, and in particular, using sand. We're at Manor Farm Pond 17, which sounds like a boring number, really, but every single pond is an absolute delight. It's just sort of havens, really, and seeing this pond for the first time kick-started my interest in ponds again. It's a powerful feeling being here because this feels like the start of something, where it all began, really. OK, here we go. Mm, yeah, there's a few things kind of bubbling away there, scraping away. I'm desperate to hear yeah, it. have a listen. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and sounds that you might hear in a healthy pond, and kind of a healthy pond kind of sounds like a bit of a rave. Well, a good impression of a plant sound would be something like... <coughs> As all the bubbles release, the water boatman kind of goes, uh, kind of makes a strange noise, which is a bit like... Um, rip, 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 rip. Rip, 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 rip. Bubbles escaping from, from the sediment, which is a bit like... Um, I think I've discovered something quite exciting in these pond soundscapes, and I love sharing them with people. And in particular, I think it was special to share it with Carl. And at that pond, I mean, that pond was the first restored pond that I ever saw. And it was the first restored pond that Carl ever saw. It was a great way to witness all the biodiversity that returned to the ponds through this process of restoration with a totally new perspective. It's not just sounds that have been discovered, but extraordinary relics from the past. This is the pond we were restoring yesterday. It's got an incredible load of remains in it and seeds. The mud holds seeds that were laid down hundreds of years ago. These so-called zombie plants can be brought back to life. You can see the whole pond in front of your eyes in this mud. I can imagine the dragonflies sitting on top of the pondweed leaves here. So this is absolutely 
Um, this is gold dust. This is this is the very very special stuff. Centuries under the soil, you think no chance they're going to survive, but it, it's probably millennia these things can live for. It means things thought to be extinct can come back to life because they've got this clever strategy of laying down seeds that can live on our time scale forever. And sometimes the zombie plants that do return are some of the rarest plants in England. Carl's discoveries here in Norfolk have been sending shockwaves around the world. I just couldn't believe it when we found this. This is one of the rarest plants we've ever found in the ponds we've restored. Really? This is well, water violet. Seeing a plant like this in this pond is a justification for everything we're doing. We're restoring things which are mega rare in the landscape and coming back to life. The key to recovering farmland ponds to protect England's wildlife is the farmers. I think the farmers had basically forgotten the ponds. They were so overgrown with trees and I think they've almost become sort of annoying places. But you can't do pond restoration unless you have willing farmers. Carl's campaign inspires farmers to restore unloved ponds. Our main task has been to reconnect farmers with their ponds. The most essential component is converting them to pond restoration. Andrew Hill is one such farmer. Since I was in my younger days, we've lost a lot of habitat, unfortunately. I always have, I hope, farmed sympathetically to wildlife, and this is just another step, I guess. And my sons initially went to a pond day that Carl was doing up in North Norfolk, and he made me more enthusiastic than ever, I think. With Jack's help, Andrew can hear his ponds for the very first time. Could this new perspective form a lasting connection? Thank you. Well, should we have a listen to your pond? Yes, yeah, please. So that could be that could be some of the insects clicking. Yes, you definitely hear clicks. Yes, yeah. Goodness me! So this is the sound of plants, actually. Plants. Yeah. Underwater dawn chorus. Wow, it's like, it's like a nightclub in there. <laughs> yeah, it? like it's it's amazing, amazing. I'd really like to connect with more people like Andrew, people that um, own land and uh, are farmers, because these are the people that can really help us out and uh, kind of affect change locally. The most rewarding thing with pond restoration is when you go back. We leave it like a bomb site and we walk away you might have a few dreams about it. When you arrive at the pond again, and you wander into it, everything has come alive. And if you do that with the farmer, and the farmer feels your enthusiasm, and you can see they're enthusiastic, it's palpable. Pond restoration has changed me because I realise you can make a difference. I've worked on river restoration and lake restoration for some time, and it's hard to restore those places because of the scale of what you need to do. With pond restoration, we can transform the pond and see wildlife gains, which are they're so phenomenal, it's almost unbelievable. It just feels like a positive message to conservationists everywhere. You know, I, I laugh and joke about it, but ultimately, you know, that's the great passion of my life, really, is, the, is nature in the countryside. I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I think of. You know, it's the last thing I think of when I go to bed. I think we've restored about 180 ponds. This is going to go on until I basically drop. And it's spreading, it's spreading to other parts of Norfolk. Farmers are getting the idea, and they're doing their own pond restoration. Listening to the sounds under the water in the pond has, has totally changed my perspective of the world around me, really. I really hope that more ponds can be restored in the UK. 
I think that, you know, what's happening in Norfolk is, is absolutely brilliant, but I think that it can be expanded and it should be expanded. We mustn't forget these poems again. We've forgotten them before. We need to really never, ever make that mistake again. They've had a horrific time. For 40 to 50 years, they've been abandoned and overgrown. And they've not been celebrated. And what we're trying to do with our pond project is to bring them to the fore again, because they're the places that a lot of people made their early wildlife memories. They've connected people with nature. We just need to turn back the clock, really.